Hello, today's service for Good Friday is a service of scripture and prayer that helps us to enter into the experience of Christ's suffering. And if you're a regular uh, member of our church, then you would have received an email with some suggestions around some music that you might like to play, some YouTube videos to help you to reflect and to meditate on this uh, very significant day of our church's year. If you're not a regular churchgoer and you've nevertheless found yourself watching this video for some reason, I want to welcome you to what follows. Uh, I honestly believe that the events we're going to reflect on in the next few moments are of absolutely uh, central significance in human history and to each of our lives. But I should warn you as we start that uh, they're not easy events to dwell on. Um, there's nothing about what follows that's really designed to be entertaining. Um, it's designed to help us to reflect and grapple in a fairly serious way with one of the darkest chapters in our human story, but also uh, the most significant chapter in our human story. A quick word as we begin to those of you who are part of this particular church community and who may be tempted to feel that uh, you're missing out on your normal Good Friday service. Uh, I guess I want to challenge uh, that belief a little bit. It's true that things are really diff difficult and different this year. Uh, but in a way, what I want you to try and think about is the fact that this is a year when we don't miss out on Good Friday, but we kind of get to share it with the whole world. Uh, right now, our whole world is hurting and, and perhaps is more able than it usually is to grapple and to enter into in a serious way with the darkness and the hard things and, and uh, the spirit of Good Friday and therefore to unlock its true meaning. So I see this year as an opportunity, really, um, even though it's uh, frustrating at a few levels for us. I'm going to open our time together with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, look with mercy on this your family for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and to be given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. After we have a, a short spot for the children, we're going to then hear from some scripture readings. They are long readings, but they're important. And I'd encourage you to make yourself comfortable and really seek to enter into the spirit um, and the depths of the words and the experiences that we're going to be hearing about uh, through the words of the Old and New Testaments. Some strange things have been happening. Dad's going to work in business shirt at the top, pyjamas at the bottom. Parks closed, people lining up just to get into Coles. S suddenly, screen time is a good thing for your education. And school holidays cancelled. Well, the day that Jesus died, some strange things happened too. The sun stopped shining for three hours. The earth shook. The temple curtain tore in two from top to bottom all by itself. Something big was going on. Jesus was not an ordinary criminal dying on a Roman cross. He was the Son of God, dying for sins to bring people back to God. Something big was happening. Hi everyone, my name's Deb. I go to the eight o'clock service at St Mary in the Valley, although I have been known to moonlight when the boys were little, we went to the 9.30. Um, I hope you're all doing well. I'm still working at the best shop, bookshop in the world. And when I'm home, I'm studying as well as looking after the family. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, verse 13, and then chapter 53, verse 12. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured himself out to death and was numbered with the transgressors. 
yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Hear the word of the Lord. The psalm this morning is Psalm number 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not human, scorned by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me and they shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth. And since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls encircle me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs are all around me. A company of evil doers encircles me. My hands and feet have shriveled. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far away. O oh, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. From the horns of the wild oxen you have rescued me. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. For you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. To him, indeed, shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. This is my sister Esther and my dad Ross. Um, we're from Ave Church. Uh, you might have seen Dad and me playing um, on the church YouTube channel. That song I'm Missing is actually playing for all of you. I wish we could have a concert, but maybe we'll post another one and you can enjoy the music from home. Um, okay, so today we're reading from John chapter 18 and 19. Okay, okay the betrayal and arrest of Jesus. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. 
Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside of the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus and his dis about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I've always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I've said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. And the Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is the truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. <laughs> Chapter 19 Then Pilate took <clears throat> Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, 
Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. <clears throat> Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to the law, he ought to die, because he is claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin and in Greek. Then the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfil what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, In order to fulfil the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, They will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, 
weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Lord God, I pray that you will help me to speak about the events of Jesus' suffering in a way that does at least some justice to the enormity of what he has done for us. It's in his name that I pray this. Amen. Well, friends, uh, this Good Friday, I thought it might be helpful for us to look at the, the events of Good Friday, the, the death, the crucifixion of Jesus, as a way to help us come to terms with and to process a lot of the suffering in our world at the moment. And there's an awful, an awful lot of it. Suffering, pain, death, these are not new experiences. Um, they've been part of our human story from the very beginning. But normally they're experienced by us as individuals. But what's unusual at the moment is that as we go, we're going through a global pandemic and therefore the whole world is responding to the same event. In, in a weird sort of way, it's kind of unifying. Now, we don't all respond from the same vantage point. We have vastly different um, health safety nets. We have vastly different wealth to draw on. Uh, we're not in the same position, but we are responding to the same thing. But of course, where we do revert back again, in many cases, to being just individuals, is in the way that we respond to this one thing. The way we respond will differ from person to person based on our religious beliefs, our philosophy of life, our life experience. And so it's no surprise that we'll see people manifesting different ways of dealing with the awful reality of suffering and disease and death in our world right now. Now one of the ways of processing the suffering in our world was put on display in the last uh, week or two. Um, and it took a, a fairly unusual form. What it was was a number of celebrities, uh, mainly movie stars and uh, comedians, mashing together a compilation of them singing into their smartphones or uh, into their web cameras a, the, the words of John Lennon's classic hit, Imagine. Now, I'm sure you have heard the song. You know the words. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. It was intended well, I think. Um, these people were, were making an effort to offer a gift to the world as an attempt to console. But how did it go down? Well, look, another unifying thing in our world at the moment is that it didn't go down very well. The consensus, the reaction to this video uh, was almost without exception, as far as I can tell, one of horror. Um, the, the criticism made of it was that it was tone deaf. Now, that criticism could be understood in two different ways. Um, it could be understood just re in, in referring to the musical quality of the video, and on that score you would have to say, without wanting to be overly critical, it is a fairly average performance. But the claim that what they did was tone deaf is about more than the, the fact that they couldn't all agree on which key to sing in. Many people watching that video, even many people without religious belief at all, recognised how unlikely it was that people facing sickness and pain and fear and the loss of loved ones would gain any real comfort from responding to an invitation to imagine the bleak vision of John Lennon's secular utopia. It's hard to see how that vision is going to provide genuine solace and hope to the grieving. It's hard to see what comfort is going to be found in imagining that this virus-filled world of death is all that there is and all that there ever will be. That there's no deeper mystery, there's no deeper meaning behind the, the physical things that we can see and touch. Now what I'm doing now is not, strictly speaking, making an argument against the truth of what John Lennon is saying. It may or may not be true, although I would just say as an aside, the fact that it cannot offer comfort might at least be a hint 
that at some level it, is, it has a distant relationship to reality. But my point here is more the, the, this. It's that imagining anything is not going to ultimately offer us a very compelling answer to the problems the world is facing. Today what I want to do is draw attention to another possibility, and it's the possibility that Good Friday presents us with, and one that has been shown to provide genuine, profound comfort to many millions of people as they have faced their, their darkest hours. And this option is, although it's, it does open up our imaginations ultimately in some very powerful ways, it's not in the first instance a call to imagine anything. Instead, it is a call for us to look, to look, to look at an event in history, the event of Jesus' suffering, it, it, which occurred over several hours in the course of one night and then the following day, and to hear recited to us this dreadful story read in its fullness, the story of an innocent man, the very best of men actually. He's a man who is wise and good and loving and truthful. But he is falsely accused, he is wrongly condemned, he's then subjected to a particularly hideous and degrading death. And that story is the story that Christianity offers to a world in pain. Not a retreat into an imaginary world, but the opposite in fact, it's an intensity of focus on the gritty reality of this instance of human suffering. Christian faith takes so seriously the reality of suffering that it places one extreme instance of it right at its very centre. And it makes the terrible symbol of this suffering, the cross, a thing which in the ancient world was feared and, and um, seen as disgusting. And it makes this symbol the, the very central symbol of our faith. It offers this forward as a refutation of any naive attempt, whether it's a religious attempt or a secular one, to imagine, to wish away the hard and painful realities of life. Further than that, Christianity makes the claim that no suffering, no death, no pain can ever be fully and truthfully understood without at least some reference to this particular instance of suffering, the sufferings of Jesus, that somehow in that event the consolation we need can be found. Now the answer that the cross of Jesus offers is not one that comes cheap and as we've heard in our readings today, it's, it's a painful journey. It's a journey that goes through the spiritual abandonment of Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It comes as the fulfilment of the mysterious ancient prophecy in the book of Isaiah that speaks of an innocent man who will bear the sins of many. And the story contains some pretty terrible ingredients, a, a, a violent arrest, desertion by friends and companions, uh, falsehoods presented as though they are facts, a corrupted judicial system, and a good man hung out like a piece of meat to experience a very public and humiliating death. Today is not the day, I think, to try to understand in detail how it is that this event that we're looking at helps us because it's not offered to us in the first instance as a philosophical answer to the problem of suffering and it's certainly not offered to us as a, as a nice and pleasant thing for us to imagine. It's offered instead as the true story of God's entry into our world's reality of pain and suffering and death. And it's offered with the claim that somehow in the dark, mysterious, unfathomable depths of this man's physical and spiritual agony, the pain of the whole world is somehow brought into the very being of God, where it is finally met and overcome by God's love and his life and his healing power. That although God in himself is a being of infinite joy and peace and love and holiness, he has voluntarily taken the part of the sufferer and the victim, the condemned criminal, so that you and I can be set free from the things that we fear. 
What we discover in Good Friday is that we meet God in the most unlikely of places, even in the reality of suffering. It's in this dreadful event that we find a God who has come near to us, a God who has come near to you. You might be tempted to think that God couldn't know and doesn't care about your particular fears and sufferings and hardships. There is certainly a fair bit of evidence that the universe doesn't care, the virus doesn't care, but God cares enough to have entered our world and not just to have entered it, but to place himself at the very lowest place within it as in the place of a victim, our victim in fact, the one who receives our violence and the injustices that we deliver. And he experiences our fear and he cries our tears and he goes through this profound injustice. He has nails smashed through his wrists and his feet and humiliatingly he is strung up publicly as this great warning to others not to not to um, live in the way that he has been commending, not to challenge the people that he has been challenging. I think it's significant for us today to note that crucifixion killed its victims by placing so much pressure and weight on their lungs that they would asphyxiate. And in a time when so many people are dying from an illness that deprives them of their oxygen supply, we have here a reminder of a God who even knows what that is like. Now this isn't the end of the story. There's much more to be said and we'll say some of that on Easter Sunday. But I want to pause now and just finish by asking two things or, or, or asking the question, what does this mean? What does Jesus' sufferings mean for us? And to, to answer it in two ways, I guess. Firstly, it means for us that while the experience of Jesus' suffering does not rescue us from our own experiences of suffering, what it does do, I think, is it dignifies our experience of suffering. It lifts them up to something more wonderful than we would have expected. It says to us that this need not just be a, a physical or a psychological or an economic trial and experience. This can also be an experience of genuine, lasting spiritual benefit for us. Because we know that in our pain, God is near us and God is with us. And he, he is doing something here in, in, in tremendous agony that will eventually free us from pain, even if that absence of pain doesn't come yet. We know that as we suffer, we know that in our anxieties and in our fears and in our grief, God is very much here with you and with me. My final thought today is, is this, and it's not something that I've dwelt on much in this reflection, but it has to be spoken about because it's present wherever the New Testament reflects upon the death of Jesus. The story of this God who comes into our suffering is also a story at the same time about our sin, our misplaced desires and our consistent misalignment with what is best for us and with God. Sometimes we are indifferent to God, sometimes we are hostile to God. In the, the stories of Jesus' death, we are confronted with our own capacity even to take up violence against God. Now, this problem is also being dealt with in Jesus' death. And like our experience of suffering, it doesn't mean that we will now be spared from being sinners. We are still a bunch of sinners, very much so. What it does mean, though, is that the fundamental spiritual power of sin, the power that has been over us and the power that seeks to keep us separated from God, that power has been broken. It's no longer there to keep us from God and to keep God from us. This is good news and it's why this is Good Friday, even though it's painful Friday. And so the answer to the sufferings of our world are not going to be found ultimately by imagining anything, but they're going to be found instead by looking, by looking to Jesus' death 
because it's there that we find a God who is with us, who knows what it is to suffer and who is with us in our pain. And even the most destructive force in the universe, the thing that's in here, in our hearts, ultimately, even that now, cannot keep us from a God who is that determined to be near to us. Amen. We're now invited to bring our burdens to the foot of the cross. God shows great love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So let us now confess our sins so that we can, in fact, leave our burdens here at the cross of Jesus and no longer be crushed by the weight of them. Let's pray together. O oh Christ, we are stripped bare by your suffering. You see our dreams, our demons, and the secrets that we keep even from ourselves. Forgive all that needs to be forgiven. Heal all that needs to be healed. Awaken all the good that sleeps in us. Banish all the fears that paralyse us. Put the power of your cross into our lives forever and clothe us with hope and love. We have turned our hearts to God in repentance and our sins are laid bare before the cross of Jesus Christ. And so in the name of the living God, your sins are forgiven. Amen. We are forgiven. Sin's power is broken. And so knowing the forgiveness of God, let's now bring the needs of the world into his presence as we pray together. Let's pray. God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but so the world might be saved through him. So let us bring the needs of the whole world to the foot of the cross of Christ. I ask you to pray for the Church of God throughout the world, that God the Almighty, Eternal One, will guide her and gather her in unity and in peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, you have shown your glory to all nations in Christ your Son. Guide the work of your church. Help it to keep the faith, proclaim your name, and bring your salvation to all people. I ask you to pray for God's people in their vocation and ministry, and also for all bishops and priests and deacons, for Mark, our bishop, and for all who are preparing for baptism and confirmation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, by your spirit, you teach your church and make us holy. Help each of us to do your work more faithfully. I ask you to pray for all who confess Christ crucified, that God may heal our divisions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, in baptism you make us one in Christ. Help us to persevere in faith and make us one in love and service. I ask you to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and for the Jewish people, the first to hear the word of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, long ago you gave your promise to Abraham and Sarah. Bless the people you first made your own. 
Keep them in the love of your name and in faithfulness to your covenant. I ask you to pray for all who do not look to Christ as Saviour and all who do not believe in God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, you created man and woman in your image. Draw all people to yourself, that they may acknowledge you as the maker and redeemer of all, and know Christ's mercy and grace. I ask you to pray for the peace of the world, for all those in authority and for all who shape our common life. Holy God, you desire justice for all the earth. Guide our leaders and guard all peoples in the way of righteousness, freedom and peace. I ask you to pray for the sick, the dying and all in need. For the homeless, the hungry, the oppressed and for those in darkness and despair. Particularly, uh, we're praying and mindful today of the victims of coronavirus. And in our own community, we, we're praying for Bruce Davey um, as he faces uh, some uncertain times awaiting surgery, possibly. We pray for his family. We pray for Marion. Marion Stokes and others who are unwell at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, in uh, Holy God, all tenderness and healing flow from you. Give strength to the weary and courage to the downhearted and show mercy to all who are in trouble. Most merciful God, we commit ourselves to you and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have died and are alive in Christ, we may come to the fullness of eternal joy and the joy of the resurrection in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, the story of your suffering is written on our hearts and the salvation of the world is in your outstretched hands. Keep your victory always before our eyes, your praise on our lips, and your peace in our lives. Amen. Well, that brings to its close our Good Friday commemoration. Uh, we, today we leave our burdens very consciously and very deliberately at the foot of the cross. I hope you'll return um, to be with us again on Easter Sunday, or rather to let us be with you uh, in your lounge room or wherever it is you watch these videos um, to hear the conclusion, the wonderful conclusion of this story of suffering and pain and the reason it is that all of us are able to respond with tremendous hope. Uh, if you're on our church Facebook page or you receive our videos then uh, you will have received some suggestions around some music appropriate to today that you might like to listen to um, to uh, guide you in your reflections. But I look forward to seeing you on Sunday as we bring our celebration to a wonderful completion.